a lot of us, uh, you know, we, we struggle to find motivation. And, and often our problem is really it's at the level of what we care most deeply about. And, you know, one of the things, one, one of the places we want to get to in life is where the thing that's most painful for us is to not, for example, spend time with God. A lot of guys, you know, they struggle and struggle to have a quiet time, but really the men who consistently have say quiet times are the ones who it's a more painful thought to not get the time with God Hmm. than the effort of spending time with God. And, you know, if we want to know, if you you really want to know what you're most passionate about, I mean, there's, there's four feelings, four emotions that correspond to, to love or that underlying uh, driving attraction that we have to, to pursue something in life. And, now, these four, I think they're an interesting four things to think about right now with this virus and all the, the time that we have uh, isolated, but they're, they're desire, uh, enjoyment, fear, and grief. And all of these are indicative of, of what we care about. So, you know, the things that we desire, desire is just wanting to draw closer to something, wanting to have more of it, wanting to uh, be able to, to share in it. And, you know, whatever you desire most is, is what you care most about. And, um, you know, very close with desire is enjoyment. You know, we, the things we love are the things that, you know, as we're getting to do them, they bring us great delight or joy. So, you know, you mentioned sports and I mean, how many guys, uh, you know, they constantly think about, um, you know, hoping for LSU football season to come around, you know, they, they enjoy nothing more than getting to watch, you know, an LSU game on, on TV or go to the stadium. But equally there's the other two emotions that indicate what we care about, which are uh, fear and grief and, you know, the way fear is connected with love is we fear not having or something coming in the way of what we desire or delight in. Mm. And so right now, you know, all of us are really afraid that LSU football, <laughs> it might not happen. Uh, and that causes us that fourth feeling of grief. Um, and grief is when the thing that you love is not attainable. It's absent. Um, there's a distance between you and that thing and, and the cause that causes grief. And so one of the questions I'd love for men to be asking right now is, is what are you really grieving the loss of? Um, I wonder how many Christian men right now are really grieving the loss of being able to go to church on Sunday morning and fellowship with other believers versus the guys that are grieving, not being able to get into the gym or uh, not getting to watch March Madness right now. I mean, we need to pay attention to our heart because all of our lives are governed by what we love. And, you know, look at it. You know, what are the things that you enjoy most? What are the things that you grieve losing most? And um, if these things aren't connected to your life in Christ, then you're not going to be on a journey toward Christ. Christ is going to actually, that journey is going to feel like it's a detour away from the thing that you want most, be it success or health or uh, fitness or just time with your family. So we just want to say, you know, what you love matters so much. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I got to write that down. Now, the funny thing is when you said that, uh, uh, men that are, are striving to like get in the gym, the funny thing is I actually know I have a friend that is dying to get back in the gym and I'm on the nerdy side. So I'm that guy that wants to go to church, <laughs> right? You know, like I was, all excited about going to church. It was only three of us at church this past Sunday. Um, right. But I was there for one purpose. And that purpose was to live stream my pastor preaching so that our church members can have a way to watch and still fellowship uh, and get the yeah. word. And I ended up uh, taking a picture of my, I have two cell phones um, and I took a picture with my other cell phone uh, with like, it was actually live streaming and I put, when a virus, I think it was uh, when a virus tries to stop the word from being sent forth, and I put the three uh, dots, and I put we improvise, uh, and yeah. and that means a lot because a lot of people, um, and we had a great deal of men watching that live stream yesterday of my pastor, my pastor preaching, and that was refreshing for me because it it showed that I'm not the only guy that's into this church stuff, if you will. I'm not the only guy that's uh, yearning to be. Uh, as Christ-like as possible, knowing he's still a sinner. I'm not that only guy that's seeking that and seeking to be yeah. Christ-like. And and that's the refreshing part. But then in the back of my mind, I know I got friends that are looking for March Madness to come around, that are looking for the sports seasons to come up, especially football, you know, um, right. looking to go party and drinking and stuff like that. That all That's all things that some men, most men think about. 
they don't really think about yeah. their salvation, if you will. Right. So. Yeah, and that's where you know we need to pay attention to these things. Like, yeah, what are we thinking about? Where are we investing our time? Um, you know, where is our heart? What are we most passionate about? Because it matters immensely in terms of our walk with Jesus. Yeah, that's right. Now, my next question is this. Now, the second part of uh, the death of the problem claims that men are unconvinced. Now, unconvinced is a pretty strong word. What do you mean by this? Okay, so, um, you know, again, we're trying to get at two aspects. Uh, that, that what we were just talking about, talking about with the, the heart of men, you know, it's the idea that men aren't apathetic. They're not without passion, but they're really idolaters. They're pursuing the wrong objective. With this second idea of men are unconvinced, what I mean is um, I'm speaking of a Christian audience. So I'm assuming that a reader believes a lot of the fundamentals of the gospel. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I think my reader, they believe Jesus died for their sins. They believe he resurrected from the grave. They believe, you know, that there's salvation in his name. But the problem is um, if certain beliefs are lacking, it affects our discipleship. So what I do in this section is rather than try to outline all of the core beliefs of Christianity, which would take a, a very big book, I want to highlight, well, what are some key beliefs that do affect our walk with Jesus, but that are absent from your kind of uh, mainline evangelical Christianity right now? Mm. And so you know, the image is of kind of a peer and beam foundation. And you know, if you start knocking out some of these supports, the foundation is going to collapse. And so that's what's wrong is it's not that guys don't believe any of the gospel, but there's elements of the gospel missing, and it has uh, damaging consequences on their faith. Yeah, that's absolutely true. So uh, with that being said, Joe, why is it important for men to believe that growth requires effort? I mean, think about it. A man goes to church for a couple of years and then stops, you know, why does the growth require effort? Yeah. And so that, you know, that's the first one I pick up on is that, um, I think in a lot of Christianity, effort is, it's almost a bad word. And we, we kind of assume that it's the same thing as self-reliance and that it's the same thing as legalism. And so, you know, there's this, uh, there's a, a certain kind of discipleship where, where you know, you, you, it's just, you know, if you're just passive and if you, if you just watch, you know, you should be transformed. But what's interesting, that's not, it's just not the, the picture that we see in the New Testament. Um, you know, Paul, he talks about, you know, running in a race. Mm-hmm. He talks, you know, he, more than once he talks about finishing the race. And you look at his own ministry, how he pursued his own calling. He says, you know, I toil with all the energy that God supplies. And he, he gives full credit to the idea that God is supplying the energy. He's also giving full credit to the fact that it sometimes feels like toiling and striving and struggling. And so uh, I want men to have an honest conception of discipleship. And I think, you know, if we look at, uh, if we just, you know, are careful with the New Testament, we need to be careful to uh, embrace grace, but at the same time not to abuse grace in the sense of thinking that the Spirit doesn't actually want to transform me and that that transformation is not going to require uh, effort and exertion on our part because that, that is God's Spirit working through us. It's not We're not saying it's 50% us and 50% God. We're saying that it's 100% Him, but He's working in our persons with our energy, with our toil, yeah. enabling us to change. And that's the picture that we have of sanctification in the New Testament. Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Now, you spend a couple pages uh, focusing on the idea of the final judgment. So how should the judgment of Christ influence the spiritual lives of Christian men? And that is a very important question. You have to answer that one. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think this is, uh, if it was... It certainly the, the, the judgment of Christ is something where not all of our questions get answered in the New Testament. There's lots of things we would like to be told that we're not, but it's it's an important theme that comes up again and again and again. And so I find that most Christian guys they really don't know what to do with it, and so they just kind of ignore it. When I think it's a dangerous uh, position to land in. I'll, I'll read um, this is from First Corinthians uh, chapter three verses thirteen. Uh, to 15. And uh, Paul, he's been talking about, you know, the foundation that's been laid um, and the way in which, you know, uh, workers, including, you know, all of us, that we either contribute 
gold, silver, and precious jewels, or wood, hay, and stubble. And this is what he said. He said, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it Hmm. because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Now, here here are the key points, I think, in terms of just uh, discipleship. Uh, Paul's very clear. He's very clear that there's no such thing as losing our salvation. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we just need to own those truths and make sure that nothing infringes upon them at all. But Paul's also clear that what we do matters in that uh, there are rewards that can be gained or lost and that uh, in, in a way we can actually waste our lives as Christians. And I think that's the idea men need to contemplate that there's the capacity to use our lives somehow to contribute to what God is doing. And all of us can do that. You know, whether you're sweeping streets or whether you're the president of the United States or whether you're a pastor in a church, that, that we have the capacity to uh, contribute gold uh, or precious metals is, is what Paul says. But likewise, it can be hay, wood, and stubble. Mm. And so, you know, we need to ask that question, you know, what do we want to do with our lives? Do we want to invest it in just short-term pleasure that ultimately will burn up, Paul says, and amount to nothing? Or do we want to live with an eternal horizon and invest in eternity, trusting that somehow, in a way that we don't fully understand, but these things are going to carry on and can actually result in a kind of reward, which uh, a lot of the older Christians described as a, a fuller enjoyment of God. So it's a teaching I think that's really important to sustain motivation, but that a lot of guys don't know what to do with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I could tell you, I want to be, uh, or ordained as a pastor, uh, but not really preach. Doesn't make any mm. sense. I know it's a, it's a very odd request. Um, I'm not saying I would never preach, but, um, ever since I was a kid, I remember wanting to be a pastor, uh, because at a young age, I understood the reasoning for Christ and, and and why he came and died for our sins and the purpose that he did that. And, you know, I could see the love behind it. Um, and I remember, uh, this quote, I don't know who said it, uh, but my friend texted it to me and it was probably his quote. And he said, you know, when you learn to sit at the table with Judas, you will learn the love of Jesus Christ, you know? So thinking about that quote at a young age, my heart's always been with preaching the gospel and telling people about Jesus. And that's been my mm-hmm. mandate since I can remember. Now, obviously, when you get to high school, nobody wants to be a preacher because that's not cool. So you think about something else to do with, with your career. And, you know, I, I'm not upset with being in law enforcement. Um, I actually love being in law enforcement. I think God has me here for a reason. But at times I can kick myself because I should have been. Uh, in seminary and working toward um, a master's in divinity. But that's not saying that God is not using me where I am. And me personally, I am paying attention to my heart and the things that do attract me more uh, versus the things that disattract me. So I'm kind of keeping an eye on that. I'm not doing the best at it because I'm not perfect. However, I'm watching it. (laughs) Yeah, that's good. Now, um, you want moving on. So let's talk about the danger of drawing a strict line between the sacred and the secular. And I'm talking Mm. strict line. So why is this uh, damaging to the spiritual growth of men? Yeah. You know, one of the, uh, one, one of these, uh, pillars, uh, that, that I think is missing is just, it's labeled the spiritual the spiritual potential of ordinary men. Um, you know, there's this uh, sense that you know there's two classes of uh, Christians that kind of correspond to two types of jobs or professions. And so, you know, you've got the the sacred calling and you got the the secular calling. And so, you know, the kind of athletes on the field are the pastors and the the missionaries and people who do it full time and, and have pay. And then everybody else kind of uh, supports, you know, from the home front. And it's not that we don't do anything, but it's not really the front line either. And so because of that, we can be a little bit more distracted and a little bit less focused and um, honestly, a little bit less, a little bit less inspired because, again, we're we're on the secular side, not on the sacred. 
And I think that's just real damaging. I think, you know, the picture in the news.